Welcome to the second Education at the Margins conference. Kindly settle down as we begin the program in a few minutes. Before we start, let us run down a few notes for this event. This Zoom event is broadcasted live on Facebook. Follow us at Education at the Margins. We're also updating live on Twitter via EATM Confe. Everyone will be given a chance to ask questions at the Q&A portion towards the last part of the program. Audience may use the Zoom chat for queries or concerns. Welcome to Education at the Margins, a Global Alliance online conference, which invites aspiring and current educators, policymakers, business leaders, and representatives of like-minded organizations to come together for a two-hour discussion on the ways we can help easing learning loss two years since the start of the pandemic. This is EATM2, Serving the Underserved Learning Systems for Poverty. Please welcome our distinguished panelists for tonight. From the Philippines, Dr. Milwida Guevara, President of Synergia Foundation. Dr. Guevara's organization, Synergia Foundation, works with policymakers, local leaders, and institutions and communities across the Philippines to help them execute change to improve educational governance and leadership. Also from the Philippines, Mr. Francis Larias, FINMA Education's Chief Learning Officer. FINMA Education's Team Learning co-designs and helps improve programs that help their students get into school, finish school, and get a job, whether they complete the program or not. From Africa, Jessica Reese Jones, founder of Africa X Academy. Jessica is a recognized leader with two decades of experience in strategic leadership, general management, and humanitarian work across a broad range of institutional and cultural contexts. From the United States, Dr. Charles Prince. Dr. Prince has worked for over 50 years in higher education. He is currently the Chief Higher Education Officer of Global Education Executives, which is a firm that supports schools with strategic planning, operational excellence, and external engagement. Last but not the least, from Pakistan, Fahad Tanvir, CEO and co-founder of EDCASA the country's fastest growing ed tech company. EDCASA helps high school students prepare and pass standardized tests and exams with hyper-local content, competitions, and quizzes 
available on the EDCASA app. To formally begin the discussions tonight, let us welcome FINMA Education Senior Strategy. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for this 2022 edition. A special thanks to our panelists today who are joining us from all over the globe. So in January 2021, about a year into the COVID-19 pandemic, we gathered to discuss the widening gaps in education, what with all the difficulties surrounding school closures and the attempt at transition to remote learning. We talked about what we might do to mitigate these. After two years of closure, the numbers have gotten worse as we saw earlier. But also it seems that in those two years, we've been given a unique opportunity to reshape education for those at the margins, our disadvantaged youth. But isn't it common to all youth? We'll jump right into this and I'll start with Dr. Prince. DC, how different is it really teaching students in poverty? Well, good morning everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. I think to your question, um, teaching those at the margins, or at least those in poverty, is one thing that we can all accept is that we're all broke, right? That we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of resources. And so we don't have to have certain conversations about affordability as we would in certain, at certain institutions or in certain spaces across the globe. And so one of the things that we know for a fact is that working with people who are in poverty, we have to make sure it is relevant to their lives. Uh, at the moment, we're not trying to educate people to teach them about Socrates. We are not here to educate people in poverty to teach them about, um, so, you know, but we want them to know basic math, but we want them to know relevancy in mathematics or relevancy in finances that help them understand how to apply these certain, these certain skills in their day-to-day -day lives. If it's not relevant, if you don't give the people who are poor a sense of belonging in your system or in your culture, then clearly we're not we're not meeting those who are in poverty, right? And so we've got to really focus on the fact that this is more than just finance. This is really about how do we change trajectory in generations moving forward. And that's why we have to start educating not just the student, but the family. We're realizing that people who are uh, in poverty are living together in communities or families uh, much more in the sense of in our faces as educators than we have seen in previous years. Uh, obviously, being poor or um, the, the COVID, uh, as we call it, the COVID pandemic, has really exacerbated the rich and the poor. And so now people are having to make certain decisions. And let's talk about inflation and recession and all the other things that are going on. People are having to make certain decisions about their financial uh, capabilities, where they live, uh, what kind of jobs they can take. And so now we now have to educate the family because just educating one person or the child or the age relevant individual is no longer a part of the system. We now have to educate mom and dad. We now have to educate grandma and grandpa, aunt and uncle, whoever we can get to, to get the education in the family, because the, the family is a economic unit now. It is not just the one person to go off to work and bring the money back to the family. It's everyone. And so now we have to think about how do we as a university, I work at an institution, how do we bring everybody from that family onto campus to learn in a degree program, whether they stay for two years, three years, four years, whether in the UK, US, um, and wherever you might be, how do we bring the entire family on? And so really focusing on the relevancy of our education, of our content um, to the people that we're trying to educate. And I think lastly, and I'll stop here, is really around affordability. I think the conversations that we're having about uh, the price of education, what does it cost us now um, to, to provide a level of education uh, to those who are in poverty. I think, again, because of COVID in inflation, uh, the costs are going to be exacerbated. Uh, but ultimately, we've got to start thinking about how do organizations change their identities, their cultures, their organizational structures to meet the needs of those who are in poverty, which is a very different conversation now, because in previous years, in previous decades, it's always been about, I have set up my organization the way I want to set it up. I got to go find the right student to meet the identity of who I want to be able to educate and to show off as, you know, I have the right product. Now, the kinds of people that we are engaging with who are poverty is growing, right? It's not shrinking, it's growing. And so now we have to now readapt ourselves and change the way that we work in order to meet the needs of, our, of the new students, of the new population, and where um, our populations are, are changing across the board. So I think those are some key areas that I've seen teaching the poor, um, leading organizations, uh, and seeing how we are focusing on 
uh, supporting those in poverty and what that might mean for us the next decade is going to be really interesting as well. Thanks, DC. Uh, just a quick follow up before I move on to two of our other panelists. Uh, is this something you see across the board, basic ed and higher education? And also, you talked about uh, changing priorities for the family. How difficult is it really? You're now going from bringing just one person into university to bringing the whole family. That's a big change considering the pool that they work with is much smaller. Well, I think <clears throat> it's going to be a huge shift for educational systems to be able to do this. I remember, you know, back in the, in the early 1900s and the 1800s, um, when we were offering education, whether it was colonial education or, or even public education as we see it now, um, there, there was education for the community and the family, and it was brought to the community and family because of, you know, certain ways that it was done, regardless if you agree with it or not, right? Nowadays, we have moved away from that and say we built the structure, they need to come to us. We are now reverting back um, and saying that we need to bring the education to them, right? Not have them come to us. And so I think now we are we are moving in this kind of pendulum swing, right? And how do we now bring education back to the communities in which we have not necessarily built our current systems for? And we were planning for a particular kind of, um, I say the Flintstones future, right? Where everything was gonna be technology, everything was gonna be uh, through robotics. And it's not saying that we're not, we're not gonna be there, but it's now becoming more out of reach for people who are in poverty. Um, it'll become more out of reach for people uh, who cannot have access to, again, we have the conversation on Wi-Fi. And so I think we are um, going to see that we have to go back to kind of an older system first to hit the reset button, to make sure that our education people are trained, people are educated to the appropriate levels. Um, and then we can start thinking about how the future can then close the equity gaps in finance or in economic uh, ability, close the equity gaps uh, between those who are rich and those who are poor. Um, but I think that's going to be years from now. Um, we've got to, you know, get back to, um, you know, our our the natural foundational things that we did beforehand until now, uh, where we can think about the future and educational um, advancements. Thanks, DC. I'll move to Jessica in France. Um, foundational skills are not something we typically discuss in higher education, in post-secondary education, but then you've been working in this space for a while. Uh, Jessica, I'll, I'll start with you. Have you seen this happening and is there any change to what you've been doing at your organization? Thank you. And that's a very good question because what is critically often misunderstood is the whole systems thinking and it's a whole systems approach to education and it does start with early childhood development and when we talk about education it's very easy to lose sight of we talk about classrooms we talk about universities but when you're looking at levels of poverty as you do in South Africa which is the highest GNI coefficient index in the world and unemployment of over 65 percent these long-term ideas and concepts actually need to be completely revisited. And it needs to be looked in a holistic approach. So if you look at early childhood development, foundational aspect in South Africa, 70% of children have no access to early learning programs. There's a stipend that the government pays of 17 rand per child per day to, a, to an ECD center, but only 264 days of the year. Children are hungry 365 days of the year. So what I experienced when I was with the Royal Buffer King Nation, what we did was not wait for the system to change, but rather put in food gardens at the schools so that there's a real tangible impact on knowing, learning how to grow agricultural elements, real physical food kitchens there 365 days of the year, because you can't teach a child with an empty head and an empty stomach. And that's what the critical issue was. And we realized there was a massive change in behavioral and so forth. But an early childhood development starts there, where 70% of those kids don't have that early learning, and more importantly, in mother tongue. So South Africa's got 11 official languages. How do you teach a child in their mother tongue? Because if you don't get that systemic thinking in early on, it's going to impact sorry, <clears throat> quite a lot on how they understand concepts. So when, that's before you get in, even into the classroom. And then when you do look at that, as you say, foundational, 
You're looking at the school classroom environment, how many children, what the dropout rates are leading to unemployment. We face another challenge in South Africa where you've got children leaving school, if I may put them as children, but school leavers coming out desperate for what they expect, university. They can't get in because of finances, because of logistics, because of a whole range of issues. And even if they do, we're back to the same mother tongue issue, all the, con all the content, all the methodology, the pedagogy, which I know we're going to explore today, which is so exciting. Then when they do exit that center of learning, the joblessness is there. So the skills that when we talk about education, I would encourage that there is thinking outside the classroom, learning outside the classroom, that there is a lifelong learning approach from early childhood development right the way through to adult learning and inside and outside the classroom. And I think that's where technology comes in, which I'm very excited to explore with everybody today, because I think that's going to shift a lot of how to address this. It's not always about the money. When we say poverty, you can be education poor. It doesn't mean financially poor. And I think technology will be the enabler that will allow for a lot of those barriers to, to be broken down. Thanks, Jessica. It, so it seems just based on what both DC and Jessica have said, um, if, if I'm getting this correctly, for, when educating the poor, you go beyond the student, beyond the classroom. <clears throat> That's been the theme of both our speakers. Franz, is this something yeah. you've seen in the Philippines and in Indonesia? Is that the unique difference for the poor is you need to go beyond. Whereas, you know, with regular learners, you get them in the classroom, you, you stop there. You're muted right now. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so a few things we've noticed are uh, so is that it's it's if we can frame it around inequalities, inequalities around access, around completion, uh, and around employability. So so that's what that's what we've seen. Uh, as we said, um, so the, the, in terms of access, for example, your your, your typical incoming uh, college student uh, who might be from a middle class family or or some or a family that's more affluent. They might rarely worry in the Philippines or in Indonesia about getting into college in terms of paying for it. Uh, and then if they if they want to enter a highly selective university, then perhaps they'll worry about getting through the entrance exam. But mm -hmm. other than that, it, it usually it's not worrisome. But for our students in Indonesia and in the Philippines, so the first thing is that, okay, uh, can I get into college? Can I pay for it? Or... Uh, and even if I pay for it, do I do I have the reading and, and math skills to actually qualify or even make it through? So that's the first thing. It's about uh, access. The next is completion. So, um, so now if they get in, can they be repeat customers for seven more semesters? Can can, can they actually can they re enroll eight more times, seven more times? And, and again, that can be a function of, of their ability to pay. But sometimes it's other things also. Um, what, what we've learned, for example, when we studied other schools, how they're dealing with it, like uh, with University of Texas in Austin, uh, when they studied their students, uh, one of the things they learned is the moment the, the student enters the negative self-talk of maybe I'm not for college, um, mm -hmm. when, at, when they first encounter uh, difficulties in college life. It's, it's just a few steps away from dropping out. And, and so, uh, but, and then they might, they might be the first, uh, first generation college students, the first in their family to enter college. So they have no one, whether parents or siblings to ask, you know what, I'm, I'm experiencing this kind of difficulty. Have you seen this before? Can you help me with this? Limited resources in terms of that. So, so, how do we help them navigate through that? So that's com that's completion. And then the last one is employability. Mm -hmm. So assuming they finish, um, how does their body of work as a mm -hmm. student compare to the body of work of someone else who's sitting beside them in the waiting room of an interview office? Uh, mm -hmm. So how, how would their body of work uh, compare? 
or even if you step back one, one step before that, do they have the networks that they're more affluent um, the more affluent uh, counterparts enjoy in terms of job search. Uh, so, for example, children of, of doctors or lawyers who might have those contacts for job search. Do our students from low-income families have that same access to job search leads? So, so those are things that therefore a challenge us to, to find ways to, you know, like game the system, quote-unquote, for our students. Thanks, Franz. Now, um, Dr. Guevara, we we keep talking about foundational skills, and in Francis, so in Francis' case, we we include access. In DC's case, we talk about uh, bringing the family in, and Jessica just told us about focusing on mother tongue. Uh, what are what are things that you've seen or you've been able to do in your own organization in Synergia that have kind of helped? move this along forward? You know, I agree with them that uh, solving poverty among children is really an ecosystem. But I would like to focus on the mindset of poor children. In the PISA assessment, the test found out that 35% of the Filipino children do not have a growth mindset. In other words, they feel that what intelligence they were born with, they, they just have to live with it. They cannot go beyond what, was, uh, what they inherited from their parents or what they see from their brothers and sisters. So I think the very serious problem of poor children is the lack of inspiration and the lack of confidence and the lack of belief that they will be able to overcome. They're probably just uh, convinced that since their parents were poor, their grandparents were poor because of intergenerational poverty, they could no longer rise up from what they have. So there's a ceiling there that blocks them. So the mindset is, you know, probably I'm just going to get married when I uh, probably reach puberty because I have no hope. I have no opportunity. So the challenge is really to inspire these children, to give them hope. that despite the poverty, despite the, the problem that their, that their parents are not educated, they can overcome, they can become, they can dream, they can become the best of what they can. So I think the first thing that Sinaria does is to give them hope and to give them inspiration and to tell them that you are the best, you can become. And with our help, with the support of the community, you can be what you aim to be. It's really dreaming. And I think poor children do not probably have the inspiration, the modeling to be able to dream and to become big. So I think the growth mindset that whatever you were born with, you are stuck with it, they, they should be able to overcome that. And if they have a growth mindset, if they become interested in reading, if they become interested in learning and in convincing themselves that they can do the most difficult thing because we are here to support them, then that is our role. So Synergias, I think, you know, our, our mission is really to love the children and to show them that we care. And if you have the love and care, you know, because they have a whole slew of difficulties. They don't have resources, they're poor, they come from broken families. There is no modeling. Uh, so, you know, the first thing is really to let them stand up, let them dream and tell them and convince them that we're here. You can become what you want to be. And, you know, all the skills will follow. So, you know, that's uh, my value added. That's bringing us right into programs and pedagogy. Uh, Fahad, earlier it was mentioned technology is our big enabler. and you out of all of us is our um, technology expert here. How, how have you been able to bring all that together in EDCASA? Do share. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I don't know how much we've uh, been able to achieve so far. I think it's fairly early days, but uh, it's really, really inspiring to hear all, all our panelists. I think you guys all make a lot of sense. Um, I, I, I think a couple of areas I want to build on, I think it's uh, what Dr. Guevara just mentioned. Uh, it, this is something that's really big uh, at Ed Casa, um, the idea of giving uh, young people purpose. Um, that's really, really important. Uh, for Ed Casa, uh, you know, our, our, when you enter our office, the, the biggest thing you'll see in front of you, it says the bridge between the world that you have and the world that you want is an education. So it's, it's something that we really, really believe in. Uh, you know, so if you really want to achieve anything in your life, um, education will help you get there. And, and that's not because we thought it was a nice tagline. It's because it helped us get to wherever we wanted to be. Uh, you know, many of our, our teammates and founders and, our families for many generations didn't start out where we, the opportunities that we have today. Um, and that, that those dinner table conversations led to forming a company that is helping solve a very real problem uh, for a very large country. So I think I think purpose is right there as, as number one priority. And Dr. Guevara mentioned that there's a huge sense of disbelief uh, amongst young people. And in Pakistan, we have uh, nearly 70% of our country is below the age of 30. It's 220 million people. Uh, so we're we're going to be the we're going to overtake the United States in the amount of population uh, in the next decade, uh, with two thirds being very young people and them them having children, feeling that they they can't break these shackles, right? Like of of, of uh, whatever they have been destined to achieve, that's where they're going to be. And El Casa is is making that part super easy for them. So the most immediate shackle that we saw kids face was this the scare of an exam, right? A generalized governmental exam that decides your fate, whether you're gonna be a doctor or an engineer or you know, go back to school or get married off, uh, you know, that that four hour exam is gonna decide your fate. Well, we just took that exam off the table, right? Because it's not rocket science. So what Ed Costa started off as doing is we'll tell you what's gonna come on that exam. All right. Like you know, we did it 20 years ago. Exam hasn't changed that much. Uh, we're going to help you go through it step by step, understand these concepts, uh, use analytics to help you prepare through a very predictable exam experience. So you get past this experience. It's not a big deal as, as much as it started out to be. Um, and then you can focus more on your lifelong goals, right? Like wh what's going to happen beyond that exam? I think that's that purpose element is super important. Uh, and I'd love to learn a lot more how, how different parts of the world are looking at it. The second thing is, uh, you know, dealing with Gen Z. So, so Gen Z uh, is basically our biggest target market, and it's very, very different from everything that has come before. Um, you know, these people have seen these young people have seen opportunities and exceptions like never before. Right? They, they've seen people become millionaires overnight on YouTube. Uh, this was not something that was possible. Uh, you know, even a few years ago, right? Where internet was not that easy to access, and they're born with internet. Um, you know, so for them to access information is, is not a big deal. Uh, I still remember my school days when I would hustle through an encyclopedia, 36 volume, to find the answer to my homework. That doesn't happen anymore, right? Everybody just Googles. So, so Gen Z is a very different beast, uh, you know, and, and providing the learning opportunities for these young people that are born with these things as a norm, uh, you know, is, is going to be redefining how we do education. It brings its own device. Um, you know, I, I know this, what uh, Dr. Prince talked about, you know, there are new forms of social and economic divides that this is creating. Just having higher speed internet uh, versus not having internet, even if you're a millionaire in a village in, in, in Pakistan, you may have 40,000 acres of land, but you don't have high speed internet, you're going to be left behind. It's as simple as that, right? So, <laughs> so, uh, so your homework isn't going to get turned in the way or the quality won't be there as opposed to somebody sitting in, in Boston or, or in New York or uh, any other part of the world that then takes these things for granted. So, so I think Gen Z is going to see that divide. And and what Casa is doing is trying to understand this from uh, what we've learned through doing business over decades. How you you know we, we work in most of us. One of the founders uh, are people who worked in consumer products, right? And our job was to make soaps and detergents and diapers and everything accessible to every possible person as a customer. We're using the same ideas to make education accessible to every part of the country um, and, and understanding the holistic approach as, as uh, you know, Jessica mentioned, the holistic idea of how does this impact and how can we make it more accessible? It's not the same answer for everyone. 
uh, you know, so even within Pakistan, uh, you might have a different uh, product that is, uh, you know, available for a different segment. It does, at the end of the day, provide similar results to something that is sold to somebody in a major city. But uh, the purpose is, you know, to look at things holistically, getting these people moving along uh, and catching up with the rest of the world um, because there's such a huge young population and they cannot afford to be left behind. So I think I think technology plays a big role uh, you know, in, in making access, first of all, equitable uh, as much as possible. Uh, Pakistan saw a huge boom in internet access over the last decade. Uh, you know, almost half the population has access to 4G uh, internet, um, and you know, most of them are now coming up to 5G next year. Um, so, so it's a huge population that has access to internet and using it mostly for TikTok or or Twitter. Um, you know, and but they, they aren't really looking at the opportunity for uh, formal education coming through um, all over the internet. Uh, they are learning. They are learning about their communities, their politics. So, so why not leverage that, right? And we most recently have uh, partnered with TikTok, actually in Pakistan, to make learning more accessible for kids around the country, and and that's that's provided some fantastic results. So, so there, there there's there's new challenges coming and there's a lot we can learn from our past but there's a lot of things we need to unlearn to really deliver for the future so i'd be happy to, to share more as we as we you know progress with the conversation so you're gaming education uh except <laughs> you have the <laughs> that's a nice way to approach it except that you have the benefit of the internet i, I wonder jessica um is the internet something that is beginning to also be widespread in Africa? And whether it is or it isn't, have you been able to experiment with gaming education as well? How has that gone? Well, that is such a, I mean, such a hot topic. Yes, uh, mobile phone technology is massive. I mean, the average uh, handheld, you know, device uh, in South Africa is about two to one. So every person has at least two devices. But a lot of the, it, it's largely phone, mobile phone based. Uh, connectivity is an issue, A, because in South Africa, electricity supply is an issue, but also the high costs. And that is in a lot of African countries. It's not only the supply of the electricity and access to it, but the cost of data. So what we found is from, from Africa X perspective and from others is to change how, you know, coming into the pedagogical approach how people learn and how we teach are two different things. So the, as you say, Fahad, technology is the enabler, it's the game changer. I think combined with the COVID pandemic, um, it's difficult to say there are positive things that have come out of that, but I think if there is one aspect, it's that it has been a game changer because it affected the entire globe and it's forcing change. And the biggest, I hope, positive change it's bringing is bringing technology into education. So, you know, four or five years ago, if you said that you'd done a degree or studied something online, it would be quite dismissed, quite, is it authentic? Is it real? Does it have value? Whereas now you've got Harvard and they're one of the partners on Africa X, bringing through not only the content, but the pedagogy. So technology is the enabler, but what is we've got to take into account is what we teach, how we teach, and how we learn. And as you said, it's not only the Gen Z, and you raised a very good point there, Fahad. It's our speed of learning. So everybody, we now recognize people learn differently. People can learn on a bus, at a clinic, from your phone. But how we learn is different. So that the content has to be taught and brought down differently, especially when you come to technology. So you can deliver the content in a different way. So we learn differently. Instead of sitting in a classroom for three or four hours and sitting down, writing down what one teacher says, we've now got content that comes through in bite sizes. It's made fun, whether it's gamification or not. But there's, you know, in, in immediate tangible rewards for finishing a task on time. It's not based on a teacher's personal approach of how they like you or not with you in the classroom. So your entire learning experience in a digital space is potentially, and the speed of change here is moving unbelievably fast, um, which is wonderful. So how we learn and how we teach is changing and technology is the game changer. And it's very exciting to see what can be done in delivering traditionally dry, dull reams of text. 
broken down into chunks that are in PowerPoint, video, gamified, and that's not to minimize the quality of the learning. You can still deliver content, quality content and quality learning experience, but you can change the behavior around it. And coming back to <clears throat> what was said earlier, the psychosocial emotional connection to learning, your sense of, yes, you might be poor and you might not have the TV, the Nike shoes, whatever, but you've done all your tasks on time, you deliver your sense of self-worth increases and you then have a sense of empowerment going forward and gives you an appetite and potentially ability to you know, learn more and achieve more. So I think technology and certainly in South Africa where you've got the mobile phone, uh, at, dare I say addiction, um, really, why not bring the two together? And we, we're seeing it in so many platforms and the speed of technology coming into education is so exciting. We talk about that, but it seems it seems easier done in our markets or in our own organizations. Uh, DC, uh, based on what you've seen, what about the traditional settings? Is this even possible? What Jessica's talking about? It is. It is. So, oh, oh go ahead, sorry. Jessica. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead uh, Jessica. So we'll the... We looked at something. It's it's. We call it a little black box or a Raspberry Pi. It's um, like a Wi-Fi router, but loaded with content that can be put into a clinic, uh, a public place, a library, whatever, that people can access that content, a classroom again. So they're not reliant on the books being delivered on time, who's delivered them, who's lost their book. You can bring the technology into a classroom that is a great enabler. It's not just... Um, an, an intangible aspect. You can have people, you know, they've got their own personal dashboard, you create an LMS, their BI, which is, you know, behavioral input, you know, um, technology around that, so that it's on their phone. It's very, very real. And I think what we're looking at with the Khan Academy as an example, if I may, they're using technology to get access to information. The classroom dynamic is changing radically where what they're doing with schools is saying, let the school be a center and a hub of learning. Where you come, obviously it's age appropriate and dependent, largely high school, but it can be adapted so that the kids coming to school, for example, are there to analyze, digest, discuss, teamwork, engage on what they've learned. It's not the place to get the content in necessary, which gives them the psychological social balance to the education, the content. So hopefully a lot of that adaptability will be coming through where classrooms aren't seen as the place that you have to get all the content in to a student and get them to, you know, give it back to you in a, as you mentioned for hard, a test, a you know, an exam, but rather change the nature of using the technology to make it happen. And then the classroom dynamic is a completely different environment. And I think probably, possibly a more effective one, especially when it comes down to the levels of poverty that we look at and uh, how to bring that and make it more real. I, I hope that uh, inspires some thinking and we can have some questions on that. It does, DC. And then I'll go to Dr. Guevara. Oh, yes, yeah, I'd I just think... like to, uh... oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Dr. Casey. Guevara will, will do DC and then we'll go to you. Yeah, okay, right. Perfect. I, I think on two points. The, the first one is I have to disagree with some of the, the, the comments and statements made in regards to technology. And don't get me wrong, I, I love technology. I'm a Microsoft person. I've got technology all over my house, but I have to have a certain salary in order to make that technology work, in order to have uh, unlimited access to data in order to do that. Um, I think technology is not the enabler to close equity gaps. Um, someone who has worked on equity, equity gaps in the UK, um, while technology, you know, while we spent millions of dollars uh, or millions of pounds at the time, not dollars lost in the UK, um, to support equity gap, it wasn't technology that did it. Um, and so there are, there are things about technology that I'd have to, in essence, say, well, yes, people do have phones, um, but I think there's a difference between the phones that I have, which are, you know, phones where uh, I've got a screen, 
you know, I've got touch screens, I can do this, I can do that. And those who are still using phones that are flip phones that, we, you know, that we don't, that some of us don't, still don't use anymore, um, that there are certain things that we still have to pay for data um, at, um, to use the phones or even access that we have to now move out of our communities in order to be somewhere where connectivity is uninterrupted. And someone like the US and spending, you know, I've spent time in the UK and rural areas, in Africa as well, you have to move from certain areas in order to be closer so that there's uninterrupted technology, right? Uninterrupted connections. And I don't think necessarily that's going to solve the issues that we're dealing with, especially people who are economically poverty or, or educational poverty in the sense that I now have to leave the comfort of my home to take a bus or two or three buses to get to the nearest cafe or to get to the nearest Starbucks or have to walk, right? Because I may not be able to afford the bus to be able to walk to a place that has reliable connectivity and in some way use the free Wi-Fi at the cafe or, 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 or hopefully there is a, a, um, a YMCA or some sort of educational space where there's free Wi-Fi to access. And this is why I think technology, if we rely on it too much, we, we will see the demise of education, not necessarily the uplifting of education or the exasperation between the rich and the poor, or those that can have and those that don't have. Um, and so I, I'm a bit you know, pushing back on that to say, uh, you know, while, we, while we love technology, um, and I don't think it's necessarily been able to enhance education. That's why I said we need to go back to some of our traditional ways of educating, just bringing us out of the classroom and into, into the communities versus, versus vice versa. Um, but I think secondly, too, I also have to, to question um, in this space, this idea of using international testing uh, as, an evalu as a person who works in evaluation um, at, at my current institution, you know, this use of international testing to determine the grit uh, and the ability and capability of individuals in poverty uh, in order to be, to excel at something, I think is a detriment to education as well. Uh, because if we use things like PISA, we use things like TIMS, we use things like SAT, ACT, it's only set for people who have access to information and access to diversity of information. So think about the ideas and things that are being brought to uh, to ask me, for example, when I was coming up in school and I took the SAT, you know, I didn't know what a brownstone was. We don't call townhomes brownstones, but in New York City, they call them brownstones. Well, by the time I was 16, I had never been to New York City. I had never been to a place uh, like Boston where they call them brownstones. And so to ask me a question on a test when I've never experienced it, even with the access to technology, right? I had dial-up. I remember dial-up when dial-up was a thing, right? AOL, <laughs> you've been connected. And even with that technology, I still didn't know what a brownstone was, right? And so, I, again, I think there's, this, there's this, um, this, this way in which we are now trying to live up to a standard that is not culturally appropriate to deal with people in certain countries uh, in their level of poverty. And I can think of the U.S. Uh, we still have about 25 to 30 percent of our population who live in rural communities, Right. And so now we are just and again, it was COVID that made the government invest in Wi-Fi. And yet Wi-Fi still and two years later, it still hasn't been accessible to those in the rural areas. Uh, and so, again, even in the U.S. and the developed, you know, as we call ourselves a superpower, yet we have people in our rural areas who still can't access Wi-Fi. So I can only imagine what's happening in other countries. And I really think that we've we've got to start thinking about. Um, you know, this level headedness and not just say a pushback, but a level headedness to education where we are not completely relying on technology, where we're not completely relying, but really thinking about um, those significant barriers uh, that are preventing us from excelling uh, in this space that we now have to overcome, which it will take us at least a decade or two, because, again, the government funding behind that is lacking, uh, you know, globally. And I think to your to your earlier point as well, to your question, too, is we have to do more evaluation and assessment uh, around who we are educating. I think this is one of the areas that is missing in higher education research, in K-12 research, uh, is, you, is these tools of evaluation that are looking at um, the people in poverty and specifically those uh, who we determine and understand to be below uh, poverty levels, right? Where it, the, the tools in which information that we're using, we're trying to use blanketed information from a context or a subset of one area sampling, right? And then determine that that is the same across the entire of that country or the entire of that region. And it is no longer appropriate to do so. And so we now have to have appropriate predictive analytics. We have to have uh, appropriate uh, information and data 
to understand how to build educational pathways based on the identity of the student rather than as a blanketed understanding of poverty, whether it's educational poverty or economic poverty or um, other forms of poverty, that we now have to have multiple tools in our, in our uh, tool sheds in order to really evaluate the effectiveness and understanding uh, that there are other ways to evaluate um, grit, other ways to evaluate academic opportunity, uh, uh, academic rigor, and those kinds of things to really get our, uh, our, our children uh, our families and, and those who are in poverty up into a certain level of um, uh, thriving, as I say, right? That, that thinks about mental health, that thinks about academics, that thinks about economics, that thinks about mobility, that thinks about social, social uh, mobility, right? Those kinds of things, because that has never been, particularly mental health, has never been a conversation about poverty uh, when we think about how do we put people through education? But all of a sudden it is, and we haven't done the appropriate research yet to really understand longitudinally where that mental health is going to have an impact on academic and economic achievement in the next five to 10 years. So we really got to really think on a, on a uh, fast pace what that means for our, our, our students coming into education. Dr. Guevara, I cut you off earlier. Um, you had thoughts on what Jessica said, but I'm guessing after what we just heard from DC, you'll have more on that too. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with JC. I think technology is not really the answer for very, very poor society. For example, the Philippines is composed of 7,100 islands. And many of these islands are not connected. So children do not really have teachers and children do not have access to the internet. So what I would like to stress is the importance of making these children read. And uh, I think that is going to be the pathway for them as a bridge to understanding technology, using technology. You know, one of my one of our teachers was saying, you know, ma'am, uh, our children can speak very good English, but they cannot read. So they can speak good English because they, you know, they watch TV, they watch it in social media. So they can speak the language, but they cannot read in English. So therefore, our focus now is really to make the children read because these are COVID babies. You know, before the pandemic, we already reached zero non-reader in many of our uh, municipalities. But now after COVID, you know, a lot of children cannot read. So therefore we have to concentrate on remedial reading, enabling them to read. So I was telling all our teachers, just enable the children to read. So we're tackling the issue of mother tongue because of course uh, parents would like the children to read in English but we feel that we can transition them to read in English if they are able to read in our national language, which is Filipino. So we're trying to combine uh, enabling the children to read in Filipino so that they can read in English. Because fortunately, these two languages are phonetics. So in other words, if they can read a ah in English, they can also read a ah in Filipino. So that's our approach. The second is really we have to decentralize education because there is no way for the central government to understand and respond to the needs of children in very remote areas. It's impossible. So therefore we really have to empower the local governments, the teachers to design instructional materials that the children need. And they are the only ones. So if they're constantly dependent on downloading materials which are not even applicable to children. Children in rural areas do not even understand what a hamburger is. And our stories are about hamburgers and all this fast food, McDonald's. You know, uh, the teachers really have to, to develop the capacity to contextualize the instructional materials to the needs of children. And that is why I'm very strong in decentralizing, uh, particularly the curriculum operations and empowering our teachers to design lessons, instructional materials, which are appropriate for the children. If they can learn better in Filipino, fine. Let them uh, learn in Filipino. If they can learn better in uh, Ilongo, fine. But we cannot allow the children to speak just to use one native tongue. 
because our children are trilingual. They can speak in English, they can speak in Filipino, they can speak in native dialect. So my two points are, let's you know, make children read. And second, let's decentralize curriculum operations. Pahat, I'm going to ask you, are these things that you continue to face the need to contextualize in a country where kids have access to as much information as they need anyway? Um, and also your thoughts on what has been said about technology? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's very clear that every uh, sort of economy or culture or context, um, you know, has its own challenges, right? So what maybe Pakistan's challenges may not be the same challenges in, in the United States or the Philippines. Um, but, you know, I think it's really important to, to drill down deep into what it'll take to solve that problem and what is really solving that problem. And, uh, you know, the traditional approach of uh, sort of having a custodian for solving problems like, you know, pedagogy development or, um, you know, deciding what the curriculum would be, like Dr. Guevara mentioned, the centralized approach, that's already going out of the window, right? So um, at least in Pakistan, even though the government, for, you know, our government the last four years tried to centralize uh, curriculum design, uh, they failed miserably because it just didn't make sense to people and people have so many more alternatives available to them. They chose to abandon the government curriculum. <laughs> like, well, we have to give an exam it doesn't matter what book we use or what you, you know, subscribe or want us to subscribe to. Uh, we can access any book from anywhere in the world. So, so I think those are the realities, right? So, so yes, there is a huge challenge of access. But I think what, what has been interesting in Pakistan and which, which I think might be something that, uh, you know, a page could be taken out of is that um, access to information has become ridiculous. It's almost to the level of free because of nearly free internet. Um, you know, our cost of telecommunication is nothing. I, I, I went to grad school in the United States and I, I, the first thing that shocked me was my, my mobile phone bill. I was like, what is this? Who pays this kind of money to, to make calls and access data? Like I could pay for the whole year what I pay here for like a month, right? So uh, this is, I mean, it's the same data, it's the same 4G network. Like, so, so, I mean, I think there's some deeper questions that need to be asked, right? Like the, that if a country like Pakistan, which is economically not, the, the torchbearer of success is able to provide such free access to information to its people. Um, you know, may, we may want to look at you know, alternative mechanisms, maybe take some learning out of the telecommunications companies that are working in Pakistan profitably um, you know, and giving access to 220 million people, nearly free internet. And you look across the border in India, you know, which is more than a billion people, they have companies giving away free internet, absolutely free data services, right? Because they have a longer vision of the future. They have a much looking way down the horizon, right? So they know that their advantage in the global economy will be a highly skilled, uh, you know, young population 30, 40 years down the line that has acquired those skills. And this is no cost to bear, right? For, for that advantage, right? So, so they are willing to subsidize, you know, access to internet, access to online learning, because as you mentioned, yes, there is no replacement for formal education, the quality experience of studying it you know, sitting in Widener Library and Harvard's campus is a fantastic experience. But, you know, by the time you build enough Widener libraries for, for people to sit and study in around the world, it'll be 2,000 years or more, right? Like, and we don't have that kind of time to, to waste, at least in Pakistan, right? We have millions, we have 22 million kids, 22 million <laughs> kids out of school. That's, uh, you know, that's a ridiculous amount of people uh, to, to be sitting outside of schools, right? So I think technology... We're, we're looking at it very differently. We're looking at it as um, an access enabler at the moment, but we're also cognizant of the fact in Pakistan that, uh, and I think now the public sector is waking up to that as well, that, that kids will learn off you know, technology platforms, whether we like it or not, because they're so decentralized, they're, they're so accessible, they're almost free, um, and they're globally accessible. So it's really hard to tell a family no, you have to go to this formalized school and give this exam if you want to succeed in life and do it this way, buy these expensive books when, when they can just access a lot of free stuff and get tangible skills. I'll give you an example. The, the, the largest number of new resellers on Amazon are from Pakistan. Right? Like, that's crazy. There are millions of people. And why, why they're doing that is because it's so easy to learn that skill to start earning a, a, a reasonable living, right? So 
So a lot of, a lot of young people are foregoing going to university and college and going to these academy structures that have come up and online courses to become resellers on Amazon. And a dollar goes a long way. It's, it's $1, 220 rupees in Pakistan. You make a reasonable learning. If you make $1,000 a month in Pakistan, you can live a good life. So, so, so kids are foregoing. Like they, they don't see the point of going to med school and structuring it and getting like $250 a month when they graduate out of a, a $100,000 degree <laughs> in Pakistan. So this, they, they, their, their choice is like really simple. They're like, hey, just take this online course and you start earning immediately. So technology is gonna shape how we learn, whether we like it or not, right? That, that's not a question I think that we can decide on. It's already been decided. How we uh, embrace it is, is, is more relevant, right? Like how, how we use it to craft the future that we're looking globally for our future generations, right? Where we have uh, more analytical, uh, more uh, empathetic human beings around the world that try to solve their problems uh, in a way that is better than what has happened in the, in the past decades uh, or years or centuries. Um, I, think, I think that would be real fruit of, of making education accessible. So, uh, so I think technology is, is more of a channel of distribution at this point. Um, very, very cheap and accessible in Pakistan and many other parts of the world. I understand, uh, you know, but there are also innovations coming out of the United States. Like if you look at Starlink, right? Like I think in, in, in 10 years, uh, you know, even in rural United States, even if you're sitting in Alaska, you won't have a connectivity problem to high-speed internet if that becomes a reality, right? So, so hopefully, you know, other companies and other innovators for their own self-interest will make internet more accessible, right? So you will see, um, you know, large corporations that are sitting on a lot of resources invest in technology infrastructure to allow for you know their businesses to thrive um, which is going to open a door for education as well right like you can use that that you know <laughs> sort of exit onto this highway to to make our purpose of making education accessible also possible right so so it's, it's how we see those those pieces play out right it's, it's, there's no right or wrong you know time will tell but I think right now, with the way we're looking at it in Pakistan, and we see huge success stories in India, um, you know, success in the sense that it just created access. I wouldn't, you know, call it on the, on the qualitative measures. It's too early to say that. Um, you know, but I think the access thing has been very clear. It has made a lot of marginalized people access, um, you know, the, the kind of learning opportunities that just were forfeit uh, a decade ago or five years ago this is not going to happen for your kids. Like getting into an IIT in India was, was not possible for many people, not because IITs were expensive, it was because the preparation that was required to even apply to an engineering school in India was way, 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 way more expensive, but also physically inaccessible for people sitting in remote parts of the country. So it is possible today, right? You can do it online and many kids have made it in just because they had access to online learning opportunities for that. So so I think it's it's early days, but how we use the technology is up to us, right? And so um, I mean, I think that's that's really where we are right now. France, I'd, I'd like to touch on a comment that was also raised in the chat. Uh, this is something I we're seeing in the Philippines is that technology is changing education, and even in a country, same in Indonesia, that doesn't have as wide an access to internet as they do in Pakistan. Um, how do you think that's shaping the classroom, what we do in it? Well, um, at least in our experience for, for, for our schools, right? So, so when the lockdowns happened in, in March 2020, for example, so one of the helpful principles that, uh, one of the principles that helped us with this is, okay, uh, we just, uh, it, it, uh, people have just stopped, stopped going to schools. What technology do they have in their house right now? So it, it's it, so, and then what? What if we tailor the delivery to that? So it, it wasn't about oh, okay, do we go automatically online? Do we give everyone a shiny new toy, like I don't know, a, a tablet or a router? So it was more of okay, what what do they have available now? And then maybe let's use that. So. Uh, for our students in the Philippines, not everyone had a mobile phone. So that means you couldn't distribute learning uh, experiences through mobile phone. So, but what we could do was create this uh, print-based materials quickly enough and then mail it to everyone, right? Uh, so so, so that, that's what we did. But as with learning, 
as, as with anything in learning, sometimes you don't get it and you just have to call someone or ask someone, am I doing it correctly? So, okay, what's the available technology for our students then? Okay, most of our students might seem to have access with Facebook Messenger. So uh, whether they borrowed the phone of their parents or maybe whether they had their own phones. Okay, so if they needed like a phone, a friend type to their teacher, okay, so we, they have the print-based materials and then let's couple that with, with something for them to still reach out to their teachers while people are not yet allowed to go to school. And, and therefore, what we were trying to do there was, uh, so I think there's an ecosystem of, of for example, the, the telcos, trying to push the envelope in terms of technology. But while those things haven't reached our students yet, we'll work with the technology they have. So how did it work in, in Indonesia? In Indonesia, our, our low-income students there had access to mobile phones. They didn't have to borrow from their parents. So there, it, the, the, it was different. We weren't prepared at that time to print a lot of modules there but we could already distribute the PDFs, for example, just so they had reading materials already in their mobile phone. Of course, it's still easier to understand an engineering equation in a, you know, in a letter-sized uh, paper than in your five-inch screen, but you know, it, it, it worked for our students. So, so I, I think in terms of technology, it's an e ecosystem. Um, technology companies will continue to, to create new things that will make things easier for us. And we're waiting for those things to, to come up for our, for our low-income students, for it to be affordable, for it to be easily accessible. In the meantime, while they're not, we'll adjust with what the technology environment is for our students. Jessica, you had thoughts. I do. And this is such an exciting point of being on a panel because there's interesting thoughts. I think we can all agree being on this panel that education and there's global statistics to prove this is the key out of poverty. It, it really educated more educated societies and education is a broad term have different economic outlooks. Education has medium to long term horizons. The systems around education are not designed to be nimble and fast and change. They are steeped in years of having, you know, thesis driven approaches and, and uh, you know, years of understanding and uh, depth of knowledge, which is great. Technology now offers us an option. It is a very viable option. It is a critical option. It's not going away. It's not either or traditional education and technology. I believe it's and and. The trick is that education is, as I say, medium to long term. Poverty is now. Hungry is now. It's today. And I think there's a lot of we need how do we bring those two together with some immediate, sometimes even short term, sometimes, you know, even much more practical solutions. I think that's, you know, the key to drive the conversation of where education and poverty come together. There's the theory and there's the practical. And I think technology, I'm not plugging technology at all. I'm simply saying it is an option that five or 10 years ago was not an option. And I think it is critical to bring it into the mix. It's not either or, it's and and. And when we look at the timing, in South Africa, we've got 65% unemployment. That's not even accounting the neat statistics which are those not in education, employment and training, which is much higher. As a country, as an economy, as a generation, we can't wait five or 10 years to work out a new pedagogy before we've written new service. These solutions have to happen now. And that's really what we're, we're trying to address. How do we bring in the short term, the medium term? Otherwise generations are lost and, and we don't have the time. Just a comment, I wanted to kind of bring it together. And I, and I also wanted to, to say, I, I, I agree with that statement to the point where we, if we as organizations don't risk assess, and I think this is where 
you know, I, I come to the point where I say, okay, what happens in a scenario, which education systems typically don't risk assess, but what happens in a scenario when we no longer are allowed to use technology in the sense that even, you know, in the state that I live in, in Texas, we have a, a, a number of blackouts, right, uh, due to climate change. Uh, we know that countries are dealing with all kinds of significant issues and technology is not working, right? Uh, even the, the Starlink comment, and you know, I can even think Elon Musk saying, well, yeah, if I put in, you know, 150 or 200 solar panels in Utah, uh, I could power the whole entire United States. And you see how far we've gotten on that. <laughs> and that was just written, spoken last year. So, you know, and I think the thing is, is that, you know, it, it is an option, but there is, there is this, this pace of use that what happens when it's all gone? I think that is the, the, the um, uh, Dr. Gill was uh, point is that if they don't know how to read, um, then they're not gonna know what to do if the technology is now gone, right? And so if we're not planning for a society or planning for a future, that's not a Flintstone future, right? That is a future in which, um, and I can think of, you know, you know they, they say never say this in a, in a conversation, but in the movies, Right, someone had to think about this, or um, as as we think about certain uh, things that have happened over even over in the last uh, couple of decades, um, we we may not be able to use technology. We may not be able to connect in this way. Um, something might happen, and so what do we do in that scenario if we've all moved to think that technology is the solver? Um, we we have to have other skill sets in our toolbox. We have to be able to educate in different ways, and so I think we've got to have multifaceted people who know how to deal with it, how, how to run a business without technology uh, or, or be able to run the business with technology, right? Uh, and there might be a time where we, you know, this might happen. It may never happen. And that's good too, right? Like we don't want to lose connection with family members and other things of that nature. But, but it, it's not necessarily not, it's not a reality, it's, it's a possible reality that we have to come to terms with. Um, and so, you know, there, there is a, there's that risk person. Now, there's somebody on the call who is a risk assessor or a compliance officer who's thinking, wait a minute, now I got to go and risk and think about the probability of certain these things happening. And what happens if, you know, uh, we have to revert back? And so we as, as teachers, right, and, and I think these are the, the comment earlier about those who are teachers now need to be able to have this tools, the, the skill sets to be able to not only teach um, the, the, the way they've been taught how to teach, how to use technology and to do that, but also how to be able to do that differentiatedly in ways that are going to, to meet every student on the individual need. And that's another leap in this conversation, right? Is that now we are looking at a generation of, we're losing a generation of teachers um, that are, well, I'm not gonna say not technology savvy, uh, but again, aren't Gen Zs, right? Gen Zs aren't going into teaching. <laughs> They're not going in a lot of, of the public services like they used to when I was coming up as a millennial or even a generation behind me. And so now the people that we need, right, who are looking to make a quick buck or who are looking to uh, make money through other means aren't going into education. We need them to go to be able to use and sustainably use technology to help students become uh, more educated and more well-versed. And so now we've got a, a generational training gap in our educational system that we now have to fill. Uh, because the people who grew up, you know, like I, I always tell myself, my child who's seven and two, they will probably never, you know, they have books in their, their rooms now, but they'll probably never see another book again in maybe the next decade or, or the next two decades. But again, they're not interested in teaching. Well, not right now, right? <laughs> uh, but at least the Gen Z these people who are going to university and everything else, or even not going to university, going to get certificates, they're not getting it in uh, teaching, right? They're not getting in education. And so now we've got to start thinking about what does that mean? for a population who will never experience a generation who's technology savvy and always been engaged and involved in technology to help the next generation really understand what that looks like. And so that's another feat that we're gonna have to jump to, to say, how do we build and transform our systems with a population or a training level of, of employees um, that aren't having lived the experience of Gen Z's who will now be teaching our children. So, Clearly, technology is not something we all have in common. So let's set that aside a bit, right? And look instead at what it's done for education in all our contexts, whether we have access to it or not. Um, in, you know, we, we've talked about kids today having more access to information on their own. And therefore, that means the classroom is no longer a place for input. 
we've talked about um, immediate access to, to earning opportunities and what that means also to the importance of education, formal education to these children. We've talked about bringing the family into the classroom, um, building soft skills, confidence, motivation, grit. Now, how do we bring that all together with technology on the side? And how do we do that as education institutions that were traditionally here to bring people into the classroom um, in whatever form that we're in? How does that happen today? And who would like to take that on first? Go ahead. All right, I thought I'd just uh, jump in on that one. That's, that's an interesting uh, question that you asked. So, I, I mean, uh, since Dr. Prince mentioned some movies, I, I mean, if you look at an old Western, uh, US Western, you see a school uh, in, a, in a Western town and that school had kids, you know, have books tied to a string and they go to this, uh, have, you know, in the day it's a school, Sunday it's church school, right? So, so that was school maybe 200 years ago, right? So, and, and schools evolved a long way from that, right? So, so I think change is inevitable, right? Like, and it doesn't have to, it, it should, we shouldn't be scared of it, right? So, I think the, the Vatican also thought about the printing press as a problem, right? Like, you know, they, hey, now the Bible's in everybody's hands. So <laughs> that shouldn't be possible. So, so you know, shun this. But the, the reality is that technology, um, whether it's a printing press, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, putting the first computer in a school lab, or whether it's, uh, you know, putting, a, you know, educational content on a smartphone, uh, it's always going to be part of the learning process. We're going to raise smarter and smarter generations, right? Like as much as we, I mean, I make fun of my son, right? He's, he's Gen Z clearly, but, uh, but you know, he's in many ways way smarter than I was at his age, right? Like he disregards a lot of information, which I thought was very important, but it's almost irrelevant, right? There was a time where calculators were banned in school. Now I kind of think it's silly. You have it available, right? Like might as well use it um, and get the answer right. So, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> It's 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 not something that um, I'm sure Jessica has something very important to say about, it. <laughs> but it, the technology is is something that I think goes hand in hand, and we should look to educate smarter generations than we've seen in the past, right? Smarter in the sense that they make better decisions, they make they have higher ambitions, right? That's really really important. So when we look at kids in Pakistan, right, this is why, why we built that casa, that your aspiration shouldn't be to pass a four-hour exam and that's it right like that's not a goal we went past that and then we built amazing things and we worked with great companies around the world then we came back and we realized that wasn't the hard part right the hard part is actually things beyond that so how can we go back to these kids and demystify this four-hour exam that you know they're so scared of uh at least take that challenge on right it's not the whole education spectrum but we picked the challenge and we said you know we're going to make this super easy so these kids are smarter when they go into university and college, they can make better choices and not worry about exams. Uh, you know, that, that's something that CASA has got you covered on, right? Like you focus on the learning experience and spend more time with your teacher. And we do coach these kids, right? Like how to make better use of the university or the campus or the school teacher that you are lucky to have. Um, I'm gonna give a very quick example of how we got started. Um, so in the most or the least developed part of our country, and they had physical schools, right? But there was no teacher to teach in that school, biology, chemistry, physics, or math. We went to these schools and said, why don't you have these teachers? And they're like, A, whenever anybody gets an education that's like an undergrad level in physics, biology, they move to the large city, right? They want to earn a good living. They don't want to live in this small part of the world. So, uh, so they leave. Uh, the ones who stay behind are the ones who are really incompetent. And, and then they're looking to make a quick buck and they get a 1% raise somewhere else. We have high iteration. Um, and there's huge gaps for school kids. In the six or eight months, we don't have a teacher. Um, and, and, and it's not the kids' fault. They're failing on these exams, which cuts down government funding because kids are not performing. So the school doesn't deserve any funding. This is a vicious cycle. And this whole community is, is eliminated from the education ecosystem, right? So we said, you know what? We'll make it super easy on existing tech. We'll teach you on Facebook Live. Just put, you have an old projector lying around, connect your smartphone to it. We'll teach you on Facebook Live from a thousand miles away every day, six days a week with the best teachers that we can hire. And we'll assess you, uh, you know, by sending you in-mail assessments that you can conduct and send back and our team will grade it by using regular post. And if you have any questions during class, just WhatsApp us, right? That's all you have to do, right? Just WhatsApp us, here's the number. 
And we'll see how many schools we can teach with just five teachers, right? And we kind of maxed out at about 40 schools around the country. So the same five teachers and in 40 different schools around the country, uh, we're able to cover all the content and make, make that quality of teaching accessible to kids as projected in class. And we really asked those kids when we went designing the product, like, you know, what's the difference between seeing a six foot teacher on a projection screen versus one that's standing right there? Do you see, do you feel a difference? They're like, no, we're, we're so used to this because of our vast consumption of video content, there's not much of a difference for us, right? Maybe for my generation, that's a big difference, but for kids now, it's, it's, it's a, quite a blurred space, right? So, so for them, it was like, hey, we're, we're more interested in the learning opportunities. You'd be amazed. There was a, a handicraft school next door that shut down because all the girls in that handicraft school wanted to learn physics, chemistry, and biology, and we were teaching it, right? The, the community felt that the kids were safer because there's no physical teacher. Uh, and generally they were male teachers. So they thought that the girls are safer now <laughs> because there's no physical teacher. So a lot more people signed up their girls for, for school, right? Because they thought that you know, there won't be chances of abuse or anything of that nature. It, it became so, so successful, to, at least for our humble goals was to make this education accessible to those people that government officials were visiting with UK aid and they saw there's only one school running in this entire district. Who's teaching here, right? And then they saw us on the projection they came all the way to our office and said, well, how are you doing this? And the government's not doing it. It's because they were not embracing technology. And we're like, look, we, we're not here to just make, you know, it wasn't for free, by the way. We asked that community that one month it's going to be free. And from the next month on, it's $100 a month. If you see the value in it, pay us. If you don't, we'll just shut it down. You shut it down. We move our separate ways. We got paid, right? Because the community saw the value of what we were bringing to their kids. Their kids' aspirations changed. Their goals changed. Now they wanted to be, you know, doing something with the science that they were learning. Uh, you know, girls wanted to talk, talk about how we could improve our community by maybe improving the roads if we became an engineer or becoming a doctor and, and working with women because they saw like a lot of their female, uh, you know, relatives losing children or losing their lives uh, in, in birth. These kind of conversations came up because they had teachers from way, way far away teaching them. And it's really interesting because we used to ask them this question. Uh, when we were in that school, uh, we, we actually had a couple of our friends from MIT teach a class on physics, and we asked them where are these these teachers teaching from, right? And they, they they couldn't tell. And then when we explained to them, this is a place called MIT in the United States, and then they gave them a tour of MIT using their laptop. Uh, and you can't imagine the excitement those kids had that you know, oh wow, we're we, we're being taught by people who are that far away and that skilled. Um, that's kind of where it's exciting. I'm not saying it's an ultimate solution, but you can have yeah. these experiences now, right? So, so I think this is something that, that, that there's a lot of promise hiding here. And, and, and if schools and, and communities and governments and educational okay. institutions like ours embrace technology and build it as part of the ecosystem, not a replacement, as part of the ecosystem for learning, it can be very, very, very valuable. I'll ask, um, we, we have a little time left, so I'll ask everybody to keep their answers short, but um, I, I won't ask you how you adjusted to this without, without the internet, but uh, I will ask you instead to touch on the things that Fahad has talked about, you know, teaching kids to look beyond the next exam, uh, teaching them to have greater motivations, expanding their horizons, and um, please jump in. Ma'am, if I could ask you to unmute your mic. I say that, that is exactly the point because there's really no debate about the importance of technology. But really learning is not just about knowledge because learning involves value development. And you can't do that with technology alone. They have to learn to respect other people. They have to learn to be generous. They have to learn to serve their community. And you have to develop the ability of the child to think, to assess, to evaluate, and therefore technology by itself cannot really be an ecosystem for learning, especially for the poor. It has really to be an entire system because it's not just about knowledge. It's really developing the individual to be creative, to be independent, to serve others, to be respectful, to communicate his ideas, to be a very active member of the community so that she can serve others, she can promote the rights of others. So I, I you know, there's really no debate. 
but really we have to develop the whole individual. And how do we do that? As education institutions, is that something we can do in isolation? Is that the, the topic of collaboration with governments, with private companies, with industry, has come up in some of your answers from earlier? Can we do this in isolation? And I guess I'll ask Jessica to start in that. You, thank you, you read my mind. That's exactly what I wanted to comment on, saying, you know, one thing is we all understand the problems, but they are different. And as you mentioned earlier, I think it was, uh, Francis, around the cultural aspects. How do we bring that in? How are we sensitive to that? So not parking that, but I do believe that one thing that is the solution going forward is the collaborative communication amongst multiple role players. Very often we find teachers only speak to teachers, government people only speak to government, you know, or business only speak to, to business. I think there's, the time is now to bring multi-stakeholder engagement together into a room, whether it's a you know, digital room like this or not, not to debate the theory, but to share experience and say, well, get down to the nitty gritty of what the problems are to the solutions of saying, well, and to use an example, that works in Pakistan, works for you, and that's fantastic. Would it work in, you know, uh, southern KwaZulu-Natal, deeply rural, absolutely no internet? Will it work, won't it? Is it culturally appropriate? What about the mother tongue? How do we bring that in, whether it's technology or not technology? Um, what works for you? Could it work here? Let's try it. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have the time to reinvent the wheel. I think the opportunity is to have collaborative forums that bring together real tangible solutions that we can share and learn from each other. Not the theory, not the pedagogy. Those are different conversations. I'm not excluding them. I'm saying, but there's great opportunity now to come together, collaborate, communicate, and actually find real tangible solutions that may or may not work. Um, but at least we can learn from each other and say, let's try this in this instant, in this early childhood development. This is what works in Limpopo, in, you know, with the Buffer King. This is what we tried. Would you like to give it a bash? Let's work together. And I think that's, that's the best platform and opportunity we've got to bring all of this knowledge together in this room and others and make, you know, make a difference because that's what we're here for, to make, to make a difference, to use technology to address poverty and education um, or not use technology, but looking at education and poverty in a collaborative way because that's what the world needs. And that's what I would strongly recommend and encourage and I look forward to platforms like this really you know, unpacking it in a, in a tangible sense. And I think collaboration and communication is the key. Franz, that's something that you've worked on both in the Philippines and Indonesia, is taking, taking principles in one context, bringing them to the next, and finding groups to collaborate with to kind of accelerate that, to make sure that the context is taken care of and you deliver the kind of learning that you intend to. Can you talk about that a little bit and maybe your response to anything that's been raised? Yeah. Um, so uh, what what our experience when we tried to, to redesign uh, the IT curriculum of our schools in, in Indonesia, uh, of our school in Indonesia. Uh, so usually um, our experience has been uh, previously that you have these guidelines from the government and then you, you, that's what you read first and then you design from there. And what we tried to do this time was, okay, what if we talk first to but at, at least 10 companies and, and, and really uh, dive deep into like what do they need and and what what we what we were asking is more of what do you need for entry level jobs because that's what we're that's where we're trying to 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 take our kids to uh, they, they they just graduated from high school and they chose college instead of working that means they were expecting or they were hoping to get a better job 
uh, from the college degree. So we, we were saying, okay, what, what, what entry-level jobs do, uh, are, are you looking for? And, and how, uh, what, what would make our graduates like uh, uh, qualified for those? So we interviewed 10 uh, uh, companies in Indonesia, learned a lot from them. And then we brought that back to the design of, of our uh, curriculum. Uh, we, we learned, for example, that they, they say things like, if you show us that, that you have a certificate in Java programming, we'd rather that you show us the program you did in Java. So, 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 so th these things that they would tell us, and, and okay, so, so we'll bring that back into the design. And then as the, as the final step is, okay, how do we just, you know, frame this under the, 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 the ministry's uh, requirements so that it just fits the, you know, uh, uh, what they need. Uh, but we design first from industry. From the experience there, we will transfer that to the Philippines. We tried, we tried uh, redesigning our, our IT curriculum there and, and we found the same thing. We, find, we, we found, for example, uh, uh, the companies there saying the same thing. Can the student, can the graduate show us what they can do rather than just show us a certificate? And again, we designed it that way. And so I, I think even with that, that, that kind of, of just beginning nature of collaboration was already helpful for us. What more if that could grow? It could, if that could grow into, okay, and since you've designed your curriculum this way, what if the industry will now say, can we test it out, send some interns our way, and then we'll see how that goes. Are, are, are they learning? And then you get this quicker feedback loop. Uh, so it's there. I'm not an expert on how to, to bring government into that equation. I'm sure other smart people can, can uh, figure that out. But at least uh, that's what we're trying right now between uh, our schools and how they, how, they work with, uh, how they work with industry. Just trying to, to see what, what, uh, what we're doing. Is it, does it, is it working in the real world in your, in your offices? And, uh, and we're trying to design backwards uh, from that. DC, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen examples of collaboration that include government and industry. I do. I mean, I think there are a number of, of uh, uh, collaborative uh, experiences that we can pull from. I hate to pull from, you know, the industrialized North uh, as examples, particularly talking about uh, countries of poverty. Um, so I, I won't do that. But, you know, I, I've seen in the U.S., in the U.K., I've seen it in Ireland, I've seen it in Europe. But again, there was the industrialized North, right? So those are um, areas that I don't necessarily think are, are appropriate context for, again, the countries that are represented here and the context that we're, that we're talking here. Uh, but I have seen uh, in certain uh, contexts, places like BRIC, certain independent schools um, in, in Northern Africa, particularly the schools that, that we visited myself um, during, during our edge doctoral programs, where um, government and schools were in clear collaboration. Right, uh, and being able to work together to solve educational issues um, that I thought were at least decent enough to be an example that could be replicated, um, but not necessarily effective enough because it was so early on. This is three years ago, and I'm pretty sure with COVID, they're probably having hit the reset, but I haven't talked to anybody, but I'm sure like everybody else, COVID stalled some of those things that had to pivot and, and change and think differently. Um, and so I do think there are examples where, where government is uh, getting involved. I think to Jessica's point, which is interesting, I think South Africa does this quite a bit than others, is this policy borrowing that we see quite a bit where countries will go to other countries, say that's what we want, apply it here and not take into context what's happening on the ground. Uh, and we see that quite a bit. And I think we see that quite often with co um, previously colonized countries, right? That they believe that they have to be at a certain level to their colonizers in order to uh, be accepted, to be respected, and to be, to be thought of as a level of rigor um, on the global stage that they have to now policy borrow from their colonizers in order to be effective and uh, independent. And I think that's a really interesting context here that we now have to get over is to say, actually, we don't have to do it anymore because we can now be, and if you think about it, a lot of the uh, countries that were like the US and Europe and everything look to Finland <laughs> uh, because of how high this small country has scored on PISA and TIMS and all kinds of international testing and everybody had lost their minds, went to Finland, tried to go figure out what was working and then tried to come back and apply it to their context and realize it wasn't working, 
right? And realize it wasn't going to be applicable in those ways. And so we've seen, and even, even those of our colonizers tried to go to Finland uh, and figure this out and still fail at it. And so I think what we were starting to understand and know is that there is a need for cultural context in education. Uh, and I, I think what is, what is happening here and what you're, what you're seeing in our discussion, which you're also seeing at a policy level, is this dichotomy of whether or not students are becoming smarter or are they becoming more savvier. And I think what students are tapping into as far as intellectualism doesn't make them smarter, it could make them savvier. What I was tapping into intellectualism coming through school versus what students are now experiencing in education um, is a different kind of intellectualism, right? Um, students are now probably, or not probably, uh, in the experiences that I'm seeing here in the schools, they're becoming more social and um, emotional aware than when we were coming up through school, right? So there's a different kind of intellect that is being tapped into with the use, whether it's technology or not, these students have a different kind of, uh, of intellect. So again, I don't necessarily make it, it makes them smarter, right? Because again, we, whether or not you replace the teacher or you replace the principal or replace anyone else or whatever the case may be, you do it in school, out of school, another place, the student still has intellectualism um, or, or the ability to learn. And so whether or not you do it, do they learn faster? Or they're learning at the same pace, right? Um, is it saving people money, right? They don't have to pay somebody, they can invest in certain other things. And so I think from a policy perspective, it's very difficult for government to then say, let's do this, right? Because then, unfortunately, you might end up with a high unemployment rate, <laughs> right? Or and people not being able to get jobs in other places. And so again, you know, and we have to start thinking about where is that um, that middle ground uh, between the two. And so I think from a policy perspective or a government perspective. Uh, we are, we, we can now be more comfortable, I think it's becoming more acceptable in the world stage for countries to have a certain cultural competency to build policy. And I also think that there, when doing that, there are some nuances that they have to now grapple with that they hadn't had to grapple with because of the ripple on effect it might have on the rest of the country's um, system itself, right? Economics, employment, uh, those kinds of areas, transportation, roads, bridges, all those things come into play when you're starting to make certain decisions or cultural context. And so I think that's where we are when it comes to dealing with, you know, the, the South and these areas of poverty that are really being impacted by certain decisions. Now, Jessica, I, need, I know you need to go. Let's just, let's wrap this up for the last 20 or so minutes that we have. And I'll ask you, you've heard all of these thoughts, seen what everybody's organization and countries are doing all around the world, we know how big a problem we have. Your last thoughts on the future of education when serving the margins. I'll jump in then. Um, or Jessica, if you want to go first, I know you have to, to step out. You want to go first. Um, I think the future of education is, is bright. Uh, I think the healthy discussion that we've had here shows that the healthy that the fact that people are still invested and interested in education as a tool to get out of poverty is much better <laughs> um, than other industries who are either abandoning those industries, those industries are dying out, um, they're non-existent, and people are leaving. At least for us in education, there is still a need and necessity uh, for us to evolve and to be better, and, and we see much more benefit for long-term success. And so I think it's bright. I think we have more discussions um, and more discourse, right? Because we didn't get to talk about people with disabilities. We didn't get to talk about learning disabilities. We didn't get to talk about um, other issues that are impacting mental health, that are impacting education in much more uh, significant ways than we're seeing, think, for example, like technology, how we got off on, on that area. And so I think there are other areas that we have to explore, but it's still brilliant. So I'm, I'm still hopeful, <laughs> even if I disagree, I'm still hopeful uh, and, and committed to the, to the cause. Jessica. Thank you. I, I think disagreement, uh, I wouldn't call it that. I would call this a debate. Uh, we come at this from very different angles. I think that's the beauty of what we all bring. We bring different experiences, different culture, different thoughts, different approaches. I think it's healthy. I think it's fantastic. And I think that is the best thing that we can bring to education now and for the next generation. I think it's a very dynamic, very fluid, much more fluid than it has been in the last five or 10 years, the sphere of education. 
I think that we're looking at it hopefully from a you know whole systems approach is is very new. I don't think that's been done in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So I'm very encouraged. Um, I don't want to say overly optimistic. I think we've got a lot of challenges. Um, but I think we've got a lot more tools, JC, if I may use your analogy, a lot more tools in our toolbox now um, than we've had before in the last 10, 20 or 50 years. So I'm, I'm thrilled at this platform. I'm deeply grateful to FINMA and I look forward to a lot more, you know, healthy approach to unpacking and exploring what the education in poverty is, what it isn't, what it can be. Um, I, I think this, a forum like this is fantastic. And, it, and it's great to have difference of views. I think that's what it's all about. So thank you. Thank you. Fahad and then France. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Dr. Franz and, and Jessica. I think it's, it's we're going through a crossroads. Uh, this is a time where we're rethinking what has been happening traditionally for a while, thanks to COVID. It's been a, a little more, uh, you know, emphasis has been brought to the to many industries, not just education. I think uh, many, many aspects of our lives are now in question, but for good. I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll redefine how the next century and beyond is going to shape up. Uh, so it, it is a, a, a little uncertain time because we are going through that phase of definition. But I think it's, it, I'm, I'm very hopeful that it will be for the better. And it's better to be part of the change than, than, than you know, being a, a silent observer on the sidelines. So, so I think that's that's what I'm reading from everyone in the room that they're embracing, you know, in some way or the other, the change and and playing their bit, and that's very exciting because I think some something will work and we'll we'll redefine it for the better. Dr. Guevara, you know, I come from Sinergia, and Sinergia's uh, philosophy is really the problem of children is the problem of everybody in the community. So our mission is really to bring all the community members who own the problem of children, find out why they are not learning, and then to take doable, uh, actionable, small steps to be able to answer the needs of the problem, I mean, the needs of the children, one step at a time. We don't really think big, but really just analyze where they're coming from and then to adjust whatever we have to be able to address the problems of children. As we said, everybody, everybody has a share. Everybody has a contribution to be able to help the children become better, enable them to at least finish elementary education. That's the mission of Sinergia, to enable all Filipino children to complete a good elementary education. And lastly, Fran, so that we can ask for a synthesis from Nigel afterwards. Uh, yeah, so so first, uh, it, it's been great hearing like stories about what's working in Pakistan, what's working in Africa, what's working in the US uh, and, and other countries. So that, that, was, that, that was great for me to hear. Um, in terms of what the, what the future of education is, I, I, it, 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 I think it's, it's going to be very interesting because one of the things that the, pan, the, the pandemic did for education is, I think, in my opinion, it, it even brought to the forefront uh, issues of inclusiveness. You know, how, how do we become more inclusive, especially those who are marginalized, those who have, don't have access? I think as DC was saying a while ago, don't have access to devices, connectivity. Uh, it, it brought to the forefront wellness uh, of students, having more empathy for them, uh, understanding their context more. And it also, gave all schools since, since all bets were off when everyone was in lockdown it gave schools permission to try things that they were afraid to try before uh or, or things that they thought were sacrilegious maybe and uh so so in that sense i think i think for the future of education uh it, it's going to be very very interesting and, and we just have i guess to be open to, to new insights and, and to learn Thank you. This this for us is a first step in first step towards inclusion is bringing everybody together, and we hope that we can continue to do this. Uh, so so thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to bring in a colleague, Dr. Nigel Cobison, who has the unenviable task of bringing all your thoughts together. Nigel, hello and welcome. 
he's been listening in the background all this time, just absorbing everybody's thoughts. <laughs> Nigel, you're on mute. Thank you, S. Uh, this has been a great and uh, illuminating session. And uh, our panelists offered several insightful points on what uh, effective education for the poor looks like. Uh, educating low-income students is challenging for a number of reasons. First, they do not possess a good foundation of education ability. Franz framed this uh, earlier as an accessibility problem. In the context of higher education, Franz said that this group of students uh, simply lack college readiness competencies. Children growing up in poverty face challenges with cognitive and literary ability and often begin school academically behind their peers from higher education, higher income backgrounds. In connection with this, Jessica was on point when she underscored the importance of starting interventions at the early childhood level. Another hurdle that low-income students face is an overall lack of resources. Dr. Guevara pointed out uh, low-income students' lack of cultural and emotional capital. She noted that they generally lack a growth mindset. They lack the confidence that they can overcome. And they can rely on their family to be their role model since many of their parents actually didn't have a lot of educational experience to draw upon to offer guidance. And because uh, low-income students have a different starting point compared to their peers, some adjustments in pedagogy and educational systems need to be made. Uh, DC brought up a very interesting concept. He said that uh, educating the family is a necessary part of the solution and that educating the individual student is no longer enough. And he also said that uh, we need to make sure that the content we teach has a clear relevance to the student's lives and to their situation. Jessica mentioned about uh, implementing a lifelong learning approach to teaching students. And uh, she stressed that uh, there's a need to start at the earliest level of education. Uh, France uh, framed low-income education challenges in terms of access, completion, and employability challenges. And these are complex challenges. For instance, access problem does not only refer to the issue of affordability of education. Uh, it also is an issue of academic accessibility. Dr. Guevara pointed out the need for schools to address, as I mentioned uh, earlier, students' lack of confidence or low self-efficacy. Developing growth mindset among students is essential. But in order for this to happen, school leaders and teachers should have a strong belief that all students, regardless of socioeconomic status, could succeed academically. Fahad touched on the role of technology in education, uh, the, the role of technology in educating students. He said that uh, technology has a great potential for enabling students to free themselves from the shackles that uh, limit them. Jessica said technology is an enabler in the sense that it enables the delivery of content in ways that uh, support students' own way or style of learning. Technology provides the opportunity for students to access a world of information. As Fahad puts it, it's a, technology is a channel of distribution. DC and uh, Dr. Guevara, however, noted the issue of technology access, the technology divide between low-income students and their higher income peers. Dr. Guevara also stressed the importance of uh, reading skills as the foundation for successful learning. Our pedagogy should have a strong focus on developing this skill among the students. 
as we build our learning systems around uh, low-income students, we're actually creating a system that will contribute to the success of all other student groups. This is because the strategies that work for low-income first-generation students are likely to be successful for the general student population as well. So there's, there's a lot of work before us, but we can take comfort from the fact that we are not alone in this uh, crusade. Jessica puts it well when she said that collaboration among all the stakeholders is a very important part of the solution. Franz, for example, mentioned how his school uh, network benefited from industry partners as they flip some programs to increase the chances of students becoming employed. In other parts of the world, there are individuals, schools, and organizations who have been tackling the very same issues uh, we are discussing tonight. Their stories, our collective stories, have taught us that despite the many hurdles that need to be overcome, low-income students can beat the odds. They can graduate from college, and they can attain upward economic mobility. It is important that we come together and uh, uh, learn uh, each other's uh, best practices. And finally, we all agree with Dr. Prince when he said that the future is uh, education is bright. I'm into that. So thank you, dear panelists. It's been a wonderful experience learning from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nigel. On that hopeful note, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of FINMA Education to close this, Dr. Chito Salazar. Oh, they, they, good, good evening. They kind of took everyone away. I wanted to say hello to everyone. Uh, first, let me thank all of our speakers, uh, Ma'am Nene, of course, and uh, DC, uh, who I, I have been mistakenly be calling CP as during his visit here. Uh, Fahad, it's good to see you again. We met uh, a while back in case you don't remember. <laughs> uh, Jessica actually was a new person in the group. And of course, uh, Franz, my erstwhile uh, colleague. First, you know, I, I must admit when the, when the conversation began, uh, it was a little bit daunting, to say the least, you know, when we were discussing how suddenly we have to go beyond the classroom. We're struggling enough with dealing with the classroom issues, and suddenly we have to deal with confidence, the family, the greater context, and society at whole. But if anything, if anything gives me hope, I think to end on the last words of Nene and uh, DC, where we, we are hopeful about the future, uh, it is the passion I've seen in colleagues like yourselves, uh, who I think which is important. If we want to make a dent in this world, we must more than whether more than knowledge and competence uh, and and technical things. We need to bring the passion to make a difference. And if that's if that if that alone is uh, our only determinant of success, passion abounds in the in the panel that we just we just saw. But I would like to you know listening to all of the discussion, I guess I would like to bring out one thing. This is really the intent of and to share with the people in the room and everyone else out there. This is the intent of uh, EFDM, our uh, education at the margins, is we realize the problem is huge. And there's anything the past two years have taught us. Uh, problems know no boundaries, know no political or geographical boundaries. Problems are global. Whether it be a war in, your, war in Ukraine that's affecting all of us, or whether it be a pandemic that does not respect any type of immigration rules or borders, these problems show that we are really a common uh, common humanity. And what, what vexes me is that the solutions, while the problems are global and shared, we tend to look at solutions on a local level, on a domestic level, on our own. And EATM is an attempt to reach out. It's an attempt to find others, others like yourselves and ourselves, kindred spirits who we can learn from, who we can debate about how important technology is, or who we can debate about whether we should focus on reading or mother tongue or other things. This is what we need to solve these problems. And so I hope that this is, is our second attempt to bring people together. I actually will be frank, I'll be straight. I would like to try to organize some, some form of face-to-face -face meeting of us where we can really spend not just two hours, but this kind of problem needs time. This kind of problem needs real thought and a real uh, real sharing of ideas and debate. So I, I'm hoping that maybe next year or early the year after, we can actually physically come together and maybe for a day or two hash out some of these ideas, not in this usual 
big conferences with a panel up there where there's someone speaking and we just get to sit down in audience, but really around the table where we can exchange ideas. I hope I can see all of you there. I hope we can expect all of you there because such a problem needs everyone to come together and really find ways forward. So again, I'd like to thank everyone, uh, DC, Franz, Nene, Fahad, Jessica, who uh, had to leave us. But thank you, and thank you for your time, and thank you for your thoughts, and we hope to see you in the future. Thank you, Dr. Salazar, and that wraps up our online conference. Thank you to our speakers again, and thank you for to everybody for joining us in the second Education at the Margins, Serving the Underserved Learning Systems for Poverty. Our conversation, as they said, does not end here. And to collectively do that, we're bringing to life a directory of like-minded partners to connect us so we can work together, learn from each other, and replicate the best practices to make education accessible for everyone and relevant everywhere. Let's all watch this. <laughs>